Hi folks. So we've got our two wheels from last week's Wednesday widget. How do we machine all the surfaces, including a backside material removal and a deburr process? Let's machine a custom vacuum fixture, or let's try. Rather than use the full-size Pearson vacuum plate, we are just going to use their vacuum pump. And what I like about this one is, again, it uses normal shop air, so it's not a vacuum pump, it has a Venturi. Seems to work great. Here is a CAD model of the fixture, and in full disclosure, folks, this might not work. There is very, very little hold down pressure here. But that's okay, if we fail, we fail. I wanna fail fast and I wanna fail cheap as an entrepreneur. If it does work or we learn enough to make it so it can work, that's pretty cool because the idea behind this Wednesday widget is it's not a production series and it's not a production fixturing right now, but we're trying to make it in a way that could lend itself to producing these. Because again, if I were just making one or two of these or even 10, I would probably just super glue them down to a sacrificial plate. Welcome to another Wednesday widget. Fusion 360, quick walk through. There's some really important cam stuff here. Then let's machine that fixture up. And we need to walk in and we need to feel it in because I think having a really good fit between the two is gonna be an important part. Let's have some fun. The benefits of using a fixture is that we can clock the part because again, more than just doing a backside material removal on what's left over, we also want to walk along the part and, and do chamfers or machined edge breaks just like we did here at the end of last week's Wednesday widget. And this is what I came up with. The idea is it'll fit the part pretty snugly, and then there's a five thou deep groove. So this floor right here, if I hold down shift and click this floor above it, you can see is five thousandths of an inch, so not much at all. We're gonna thread this center for a 1 8 inch pipe tap, and that we're gonna actually plug in the output line from the Pearson work holding thing to this to see if we can get enough vacuum pull down around this, through this groove area here to generate the hold down force. Now, it's very little surface area, and we're not doing any gasket. So if there's any leakage, it's just not gonna work. So I readily accept up front this, this may not work, but that's still, I still wanna do it and have fun, so we're going to. Face it off, spot, drill out my center hole, adaptive with a 3 16th to get this center material out, 1 8 inch end mill, and what I like to do here is just take a look at how long this is. Right now, it's a seven minute operation. That's sort of my Okay, we're only making one of these. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time dialing it in to get it faster. But one thing I do want to mention is remember that video we did, in fact, card here on slotting with a 3 16 end mill? We bumped the feed per tooth up to two or three thousandths. And we could do that here to go to 60 inches a minute. I think it would work. One important consideration is to make sure the optimal load is pretty light. So if it's a 0.125 inch diameter tool, I'm gonna to say maybe 10%, 0.1, and you have to click okay, see what that is. Well, it'll be 0.0125. Uh, but you wanna keep it a light step over or optimal load because in this case, I really want to make sure we're able to evacuate the chips. But that's a good trade-off. Lighter load with a faster feed rate is, is oft, oftentimes a good thing to do. We're leaving seven thousandths on the side walls and the floor, and we're doing uh, one thou smoothing to, with a four thou tolerance. All, all sort of important variables here. 2D contour, same tool to clean up that stuff. And then I wanna show you guys tool deflection. It is real. Even though this should only be cleaning up seven thousandths of an inch, we're gonna run, we're gonna stop it here, put some Sharpie or something on the part and run that same exact 2D contour again and take a look at what happens. Because again, I wanna walk this in. So we're leaving on the contour, I think two thou, which I'll, I'll almost certainly have to remove, but I wanna sneak up on matching the fit of our fixture to the workpiece. And then we take a 332nd end mill and horizontal out the little trough for our air vacuum. Do a quick edge break and then we'll plug in the vacuum and see if it holds or not. Let's go make some chips. Our fixture blank. I machined this edge down and this edge. 
I don't care about the dimensions. It's about three by three. I just want a machined face here and here for setting our work coordinate system location. Important that this repeats. It's important that we have the ability to refine our zero and I want machined faces there, not the extrusion or saw cut. I am going to wager that if I put some Sharpie, I'm only focused on radial or the side. Really, it shouldn't take much to prove my point. The aluminum gets so shiny, which is great, but it's not the easiest thing to film. I don't care about the floor. It's not, there's, no, there's no axial deflection that I could think of. It's all in the side load. So in theory, we already cut this. So. Other than the thickness of the Sharpie, by the way, card here to an awesome Tom Lipton video on how thick is a Sharpie mark. But let's see if we, we see chips form or if we end up cutting away the Sharpie. Oh, tool deflection is real, folks. It just is. It is crazy. So we're running that second duplicate operation, the exact same tool path. No more step over. Oh, yeah. it is definitely cutting that Sharpie away. So that's what I'm trying to say. I didn't appreciate that until relatively late in my still short machine life, which is you would think, oh man, you know, five foul radial cut, a relatively stiff three flute, one eighth inch end belt. Because remember, the more flutes in a tool, the thicker the core that tool is, which means it's stiffer, it's carbide. These are the Lakeshore carbide tools. You would think there's plenty, you know, any weakness in the tool would be infinitesimal compared to how little, given what little cut we're taking. But look, see that clean up that backside there? Crazy. So after this is done, we'll test fit it. It should still be too tight because remember in Fusion, I did intentionally leave 2000 stock to leave. Switch over to the 332nd, and this is gonna machine the groove that's gonna act as the place for the air to hopefully provide the hold down vacuum. We'll see. Only, it's only five thou deep. And last but far from least is the beauty, beauty of a five thou machine edge brake chamfer. I am just in love with it. It looks so good and it's so much cleaner than a hand deeper. I'm only running at 5,000 RPMs and 15 inches a minute, which is pretty conservative. I should bump that up. So, shocking to nobody, folks. It doesn't fit. Why doesn't it fit? Because we left two thou stock to leave, because I wanna walk this fixture out, open it up a little bit at a time, just to where it just kisses that perfectly. So, what a good example, a good time to use cutter compensation. I've never used it on the Tormach, but Pathpilot should be able to handle it, so why not on live camera give it a try for the first time? Let's take a look at the Fusion 360. Here's that 2D contour operation as we normally would post it. So I've called this no cutter comp. What does that mean? It means under the passes tab, the compensation type means in computer. Fancy way of saying Fusion 360 is handling it. And if we look at the code, 
The G code is based on the blue line. That's a fancy word for the control point of the tool, but we can see that that's derived from the center line of the tool. So we could walk this in without using cutter comp by just changing one of two things, reducing the radial stock to leave, or we could come in here and actually change in our tool table the tool diameter itself. The problem is that that means I gotta walk back to my computer, repost out, it just isn't always as fluid. Cutter comp is pretty amazing. It's something we've actually been using a lot lately as we've been walking in certain parts and tools on the Haas, partly because tool end mills aren't perfect. No end mill is perfectly ground to the perfect size. So look at the difference. Here is the cutter comp tool path. On the no cutter comp, the blue line is the center of the tool. The cutter comp, it's actually hugging the geometry. So if we look at the settings, passes, compensation type, in control. So we're letting the controller, path pilot is what that means here, handle all of the tool width. Another way to do it is where. So in control, I'm just telling it, okay, it's a 0.125 inch tool, or it's a 0.124, or it's a 0.126, etc. Where is nice, we're not gonna do it right now, because you have two different columns. At least this is my understanding. You have the diameter, where, and then the total. So what's nice about this is I could say, diameter is not gonna change, it should be a 0.125. But then I can put in a where offset, say of negative 0.0012, and the total is what drives the tool path. So obviously what's nice about that is that way I'm only changing the where. And if I say load up a new tool, it's easier to kind of replace that or walk it back in versus playing with the whole nominal diameter. But we're gonna do the, the in control for now. I did have to change a couple things to get PathPilot to not give me an error. I reduced this to zero. It was at 0.06, I believe. And then I was getting another error. And I don't know what exactly changed it. We'll offer this file to download for Patreon supporters so you can play around with it. But I, I know I took out the vertical lead-in radius. so. This might not work, but hey, let's go try it. Let's post this code out. Post this, cutter comp. So what are we looking for with cutter comp? This is actually important, and I, if you're gonna try this, I, I would suggest doing a quick check like this. I pulled up the cutter comp path pilot page, and it talks about to turn cutter compensation on left, which means the cutter stays to the left of the programmed path, use G41. What's gonna happen in a simulation Tools are gonna to run on the left side relative to where that line is. So I expect to see a G41 in there. If we take a look at our posted code, control F, G41. Sure enough, there we go. And it's pulling up D17. That's the diameter of tool 17. So we need to now go take a quick look at our path pilot tool table before we hit cycle start. Let's copy our file over load G code. Now what we need to do, this is RFI, really important, offsets, and then for tool 17, all of a sudden I now care a lot about this diameter column. If you do not put that value in, you will crash your tool, maybe machine. So that's very important and that's what's gonna allow us to change this tool path. So we'll run it once just like this, we'll see what happens. But what I'm gonna do then is I wanna as I wanna widen what's being machined. In other words, I wanna make this machined area bigger to try to let that fixture drop or part drop down into that fixture. We will lie to Path Pilot and we will say that this end mill is bigger or smaller? Smaller. By telling it it's a smaller tool, it's gonna to push that tool further out because it thinks it has a smaller tool, so it needs to move the tool path more to the outside, which is gonna cause it to cut bigger, and hopefully we can do this a few tenths at a time, and each time we can just stay here at the control, hit cycle start, and walk this thing out. Here goes nothing. If we, uh, if we crash, at least we're gonna get some blooper footage out of it. Doesn't look like it's cutting much. I'm not seeing any whispers, which is okay. Uh, not, not worried about it yet. I'm guessing it won't fit, but that's okay. Let's just try. 
Nope, not yet. Offsets to make it 2545. Five. We should definitely see, that's half a thou, should definitely see some chips form here. Again, no need to repost. I just hit cycle start again. I'm pausing it. Let's add some Sharpie. Yeah, see? You cut that away. It's working. That's awesome. We'll go four tenths. All right, take a look at the fit now. We got her dialed in. And you know, I don't know what the right fit is. This, if anything, could be a little bit too tight. You can see I gotta apply a little bit of pressure to push it in there, and I really can't get it out. Uh, it's really tough by hand. I've been using a box cutter just to gently kind of nudge it up like that. So we'll see though, I don't want to do any more. So let's go over, let's use a drill, drill out a hole, and then a 1 8 inch pipe tap to get that pipe tap in there. And then let's hook up the Pearson and let's just see, do we have a vacuum? So right now it won't go down. But if I lay something flat over it, like put my finger there, see how it goes down? No dice. Shoot. We do not have vacuum. I deepened the horizontal op that was the lowered plane to let the air flow through, thinking that five thousands may choke it off. I didn't think that was going to fix it per se, but I thought, you know what, let's try that to see if more airflow helps, and it did not. So if I say, set this on here, turn on my Pearson vac, and I gently kind of seat that down there. We're not getting a vacuum. Now there is one thing we can do to help understand what went wrong. The Pearson has some sort of a bypass thing. <laughs> Don't ever put your finger over this when uh, you've got a vacuum because it will throw your part off. But if I block this, it forces the bypass air. I don't know how to say this otherwise, the technical terms. So if we, if we squirt some, there we go. We can see that's our weak spot is the edge over there. But no matter what I do, I just don't think we're gonna get a vacuum. So a vacuum isn't gonna work, but see the little dimple there? That's for a M4 by 0.7 tapped hole. Folks, this is gonna be easy. So yes, I wanted the vacuum to work. I thought that would be cool. It may be a little bit faster if it had worked, but nothing beats a threaded fastener. This should be pretty easy to secure it down that way, and we'll finish her up. Okay, got some washers spacing the screw so that it's in the part, but it's hopefully, well, we can measure below flush line when we go to machine this off. Now, yes, I've got this pretty decently tight fixture, and yes, we've got a screw in the middle, but that screw in the middle, I'm suspecting, is pulling the center of the part down. Uh, we need to check the outside of this part. So zero on the uh, approximate center, and let's just do two things. Let's jog around. Okay, so that's not much. This is a metric Heimer, but if I'm if I zero out there and come back to come back down to zero on the Heimer, that's about a thou and a half across over an inch. Honestly, that's not that bad. I'm not too worried about that. Here's what I'm not sure I like: the fact that I can push down and change that. Let's jog over to the other side. And it's... Three and a half thou, so I got a little bit more run out there. But again, well, you know, it's not that bad. 
No. We're gonna see, that's probably gonna show up in the service finish though. So what is the right approach here? I'm sitting here, I'm actually kind of chewing on it. I'm tempted to run it and just see how it works. We're not gonna break tools. I don't think it's gonna look terrible. The alternative that, that is an obvious solution is super glue. And I love this stuff from Bob Smith Industries that you spray that does an instant cure on it. Link in the video description. The thing I don't like about it is there were sort of two goals of this video. One was just this idea of fixturing and holding thin parts, but the second was starting to think about how you would do this if you had to make a couple hundred. And let me tell you, vacuum plate would be awesome. A fastener would be below that. Having to deal with the super glue on each one, applying it, removing it, the heat is not what I really like. You know, that would get it done. If I had to make one or five and they needed to be, to be just cherry, you know, dialed in, they work, that's the answer. Well, you guys tell me in the comments, what, what what's a better way to do this? Let's run it now though, because I think super glue with this fixture, it's just gonna work, like no problem at all. Let's see how bad that is. And let's see, maybe that's something that we can do a quick sand uh, or buff out and well, just see what it looks like. Smooth as a baby's butt. So one of the, I don't know if you call it a trick, but we used a small, relatively small end mill, a 3 16th end mill with relatively small step overs that reduces tool pressure. And the smaller step overs are gonna give you a, what feels like a smoother finish. There could still be some tram or parallelism problems here, but don't overbid the job. Great example of coming kind of cut back to the business or chip break side of things. You know, we're just making this part really for fun to show you guys, but, if they say all sides need machined, but there isn't a parallelism tolerance, don't make one. It's okay, folks, seriously. And that turned out freaking great. Holy cow. If I were to send this to somebody or somebody were to open this up or pick this up and open this up, they would never say, what? Like, this looks great. And I, I'm sitting here just saying that or defending that because I'm thinking, how could you do it better? And one of the first things I'm thinking is, boy, when the tool paths are this smooth, this actually looks pretty cool sandpaper, a little 600 grit, or maybe start with 400 and polish it up can look really good too. Let me, let me go do that. There we have it, folks. There are definitely better ways to polish. There's buffing wheels that so you can send stuff out, blast cabinet, electro plating, tumbling. But hey, for a few cents worth of polish and some elbow grease, not half bad. And again, we machined all faces, all sides, including the backside decking and chamfer. I'm pretty happy with that. Hope you learned something, folks. Hope you enjoyed. Take care. See you soon.